I have not become suddenly super short, nor has my Patriot become super tall. I've just got it up on jack stands. That way we can talk about how the four-wheel drive system works in detail, when to use it, when not to use it, how it functions. Buckle up, this will be a long one. Just like there's more than one way to cook dinner, there's more than one way to send power to all four wheels of a car, and going exhaustively into that is a certain cure for insomnia, so we're not going to do that. To keep things simple, there is a distinction between four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive, and on an all-wheel drive vehicle, the 10,000-foot view is that you can drive the back and front wheels at different speeds than each other, and on a four-wheel drive or automatic four-wheel drive vehicle, they're locked together and can't go different speeds than each other. It really is as simple as that. Now, if you're doing something special with your car, like racing or severe off-road, those distinctions actually matter quite a bit and can affect the outcome of what you're trying to do by a lot. But if you're just trying to safely drive from A to B on snowy roads, it's actually not that big of a deal which one's which. And because this is all software defined, it actually behaves like the best of both worlds under most normal transportation demands. And without going into excruciating detail, like more than half of all light duty SUVs and cars that can send power to all four wheels, do it more or less the same way the Patriot does. Should I do like a drinking game where every time a plane flies over that's super loud or a car drives by that's super loud, I gotta chug a beer. And every time someone stops and asks me what I'm doing, I gotta take a shot. You think that would kill me? I don't know, let me know down below what you think of that idea. Anyway, let's get back to the hardware. The engine and transmission on a Jeep Patriot are mounted transversely. That means there's a little four-cylinder engine mounted here, side to side, and then a little skinny pancake transmission kind of on the side of it. But what not everyone knows is that there's also something called the PTU, which is up in here, power transfer unit. The PTU up there is in constant mesh with the front differential carrier. And what that means is that whenever the front wheels are rotating, the PTU is turning and the front drive shaft is turning. There's no clutches or variable elements up there. It's always a fixed ratio between the front carrier and the drive shaft. So whenever one of them is stopped, they're both stopped. And whenever one of them is turning, they're both turning, regardless of whether or not power is being supplied at any time. That means anytime the car is moving, whether it's under power or not, if the car is moving, the front wheels are turning. That means the drive shaft is also turning, even if it's in two wheel drive mode. And we'll talk about why that is later. Halfway along the drive shaft is this thing called the carrier bearing. Now, the carrier bearing's job is basically to take up some vibrations. There's a bunch of really complex angular momentum stuff that has to do with why that's necessary. Uh, but the long and the short of it basically is that this carrier bearing here greatly extends the life of the seals at the back of the PTU and also the seals at the front of the rear drive unit. And while we're talking about the rear drive unit, that's the rear drive unit. And this is kind of like the differential in an old school axle, but the difference is that while there is a regular differential gear at the back, there's also an electronically controlled clutch at the front of it. And this is where the shifting between four wheel drive and two wheel drive takes place. Remember this drive shaft is always connected directly to the front wheels. So when the front wheels are turning, this is turning but it's not always sending power to the back wheels because there's a clutch in here that can be turned on and off on demand by the powertrain control module or PCM. The clutch in there is a wet clutch pack similar to what a motorcycle has and that allows it to kind of have some slip built into it on purpose. The clutch is rated for around 1800 foot-pounds of torque which is a whole lot more than the engine could ever hope to deliver so even though a clutch isn't a positive or interference mesh like actual gears, in this case it might as well be. When they're locked, they're locked. Since the four-wheel drive system is controlled by an electronic clutch, the behavior of that clutch is determined by software running in the powertrain control module. Whenever you come to a complete stop and begin to accelerate, or if you were already in motion and press the gas pedal more than just a little bit, the clutch will also engage. It does that because the PCM can't tell if you're on a slippery surface or not until you already started slipping. The most likely time you might slip is when you're trying to accelerate, so the safest behavior is to just assume you might slip and proactively distribute power to all four wheels. If you didn't slip, then no harm done, and it just disengages the clutch and you're back in two-wheel drive again. When you're in motion at any speed, if the PCM determines that the front wheels and the back wheels aren't going the same speed as each other, it's able to pulse the clutch on and off rapidly in order to get the front and back wheels to go the same speed as each other because it assumes that you've probably lost some traction at that point. And because it's able to pulse it really quickly and allow a certain amount of slip to take place, it does it quietly so you don't even notice that it's happening. The software governing this is actually pretty sophisticated. It takes into account your steering angle so it knows which direction you're steering and how far. It also has something called a yaw sensor, which is part of the stability control program, and it can figure out whether you're actually going around the corner or if you've just turned the steering wheel and you're slipping. In addition to those scenarios, the clutch can also be commanded to manually lock by pulling up on the lever between the front seats. Now this is kind of to pay homage to older traditional four-wheel drive systems. It's not really a lever, it's just a push button that sends a command to the PCM. But I guess they were just kind of trying to make it feel like a Jeep. Whenever you pull that up, it lights up the little four-wheel drive indicator in your dashboard, and that tells it to keep the clutch engaged continually. However, unlike a conventional four-wheel drive system, it still automatically turns off above 35 miles per hour, 
and then turns back on again when you get below 35 miles per hour. Another important difference between this and conventional four-wheel drive systems is that since it knows when you're going around corners, it's able to pulse the clutch to relieve driveline bind so you don't end up kind of crab walking or having any unwanted noise or undue wear on the system. That means that you could hypothetically leave it in the four-wheel drive mode all the time and you wouldn't cause any harm to anything. Now because the rear drive unit contains not only like gears and bearings, it also has friction elements like clutches. It also has an electrohydraulic system for engaging the clutch. Those parts kind of put a little bit of extra particles and gack inside the oil. And so it is actually important to service the rear differential or rear drive unit on these vehicles uh, more frequently than you would an open differential in a conventional car. So my advice is to check the service schedule in your owner's manual and figure out when you're supposed to service those and make sure they get serviced so you don't have a real expensive repair bill later on. If you got your Jeep used and it didn't come with an owner's manual, that's okay. You can go to Mopar.com and make a free account on there and you can download the owner's manual. In addition, you can see a full build sheet, just like the window sticker on a new car for every option your Jeep has and it'll tell you about recalls you may have missed. If you don't want to do all that, my personal recommendation is 60,000 miles. And now the last bit, you might be curious why the clutches to engage the four-wheel drive system are in back. That's a little weird, right? There's actually a really good reason for that. Let's check it out. Every kind of mechanical coupling has a little bit of slack built into it. So you can see here that I can turn this with my hand back and forth just a little bit, uh, even though the wheels aren't turning. And that's because you have to allow for a certain amount of thermal expansion as things heat up and cool off. They have to have a little bit of room to do that. And also the most efficient way for gears to come together is not actually for them to be smashed together as hard as possible. There needs to be a little bit of room in them for them to be as efficient and quiet as they possibly can be. But the side effect of that little bit of mechanical clearance is that you can hear that it clicks a little bit. Everywhere that there's a seal or a bearing or anything else like that, there's a little bit of resistance built into it, right? I mean, otherwise things would just spin forever. So you've got a little bit of resistance here. You've got a little bit of resistance at the front. You've got a little bit of resistance at the back. And of course, that means that if something's going to turn this, it's always going to be facing a little bit of resistance. And as you can probably figure, it would take up all of that slack we have in one direction. And whichever direction that slack is taken up in, of course, is dictated by which side of it is supplying that twist. So if the back axle is supplying the twist to it, then that little slack will always be taken up in a certain direction. And then if the clutch system was in front, whenever the clutch engaged, that slack would get taken up. And every time that happened, you would hear a little click. You'd hear this. If that was happening, you know, under violent engine power instead of just my hand gripping it, you would hear a pretty loud pop every single time. So by putting the clutches in the back, that means the torque is always supplied by the front axle, regardless of whether or not it's in two wheel or four wheel drive. And then the rear axle can just simply connect or disconnect at will and never make an extra noise. So that's why the clutches are back there. It just makes things quieter and smoother for you as a driver. I see a lot of people ask on the internet when the right time is to use the four-wheel drive mode on their Jeep Patriot. And the part that seems to kind of elude a lot of the answers they get is that the four-wheel drive system on a Jeep Patriot is not the same as the four-wheel drive system on a Jeep Liberty or a Jeep Wrangler or a Jeep Cherokee. They have different four-wheel drive systems. And so what's true for one is not actually true for all the other ones. On a Jeep Patriot or Jeep Compass specifically, it actually doesn't matter too much which of those things you use. Because the Jeep Patriot is intended for kind of a wide audience and not really for the hardcore off-roader, the four-wheel drive system was built for a general purpose use and it doesn't have some of the same pitfalls you might experience with a conventional four-wheel drive system if you use it incorrectly. You really can't screw up. If you leave it in the four-wheel drive mode all the time, it's just gonna turn off above 35 miles an hour so you have no highway-related worries. At lower speeds, it's going to pulse when you go around corners, so you're not going to have any driveline bind. Uh, you might slightly wear your tires more, but not much. You might have some kind of weird braking behavior and get slightly worse gas mileage in the city, but you're not going to mechanically damage anything. It, it simply won't let you. Similarly, it's always in automatic mode, so even if you never command it on manually using the four-wheel drive lever, it's still going to always be able to send power to the back wheels. So there's kind of no harm in never touching that lever. The lever just gives you another mode of operation, but don't worry too much about it. If you want my advice on when to use it, if there's actual snow on the road or slush on the road, or you're driving through actual mud, go ahead and pop that four wheel drive lever up. Also, if you're driving on really uneven terrain that wants to try and lift the tires off the ground, or you're driving up a really steep grade on dirt, go ahead and pull that lever up. You'll get slightly better proactive performance out of it. And also on very slippery surfaces, it'll help your ABS work better because whenever the front wheels are turning, the drive shaft will also stop the back wheels from locking up as easily. Any other time, just leave it off. That's it.
Anyway, I hope that's been helpful to you. If there's anything else you'd like to know about on these cars, please feel welcome to leave a comment down below and I'll consider making a video about it uh, if it's something I actually know about. Thanks for watching.